Good evening. Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair and our indie bookstore partners all over the US, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Daniel Silva in conversation with Jamie Gangel to celebrate the publication of Daniel's newest novel, Portrait of an Unknown Woman, published by our friends at Harper. Daniel Silva is the award-winning number one New York Times bestselling author of many books. He's best known for his long-running thriller series starring spy and art restorer Gabrielle Alon. Silva's books are critically acclaimed bestsellers around the world and have been translated into more than 30 languages. In conversation with Daniel this evening, we're joined by Jamie Gangel, an award-winning special correspondent at CNN, covering politics and breaking news. Prior to that, she was at NBC News and spent nearly two decades as national correspondent for today, covering a variety of issues from popular culture to hard news. Just a quick reminder that throughout this evening's broadcast, you can post your own questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those right after their conversation. Thank you for supporting independent bookstores everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Welcome. We appeared. Christina, thank you so much. And um, just thank you to everyone across the country. I think we have 21 independent bookstores participating tonight. And as much as Danny would like to be there in person, this is a way to reach everyone across the country. Hi, honey. Hi, it's been a long time since I've seen you. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> Where am I? Yeah. Um, well, let's see if you can guess here. Where am I? Um, can you see that? That's St. Louis. That has That's to St. Louis. That, that is correct. <laughs> that, you're the special correspondent from CNN. That, you, you've got you're, you're pretty sharp. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to start just, um, we're going to let readers and, and our guests tonight ask a lot of questions, but, but let me just go through a few things. The first is, this is a milestone. You're actually celebrating two milestones this year. This is your 25th book, huge milestone. It is also the first time you've been on an airplane since COVID started. It's been about three years. What has it been like to be back out? Um, you know, I kicked off my uh, in-person, I did my first in-person event on Monday evening on the west side of Manhattan. Um, it was so wonderful um, to- there are, there are people out there. There are real to be people. in front of a, a, a group of people uh, to get that instant feedback when you say something, to see faces, to connect with people, um, it we you know we're, we've had to take a, a few precautions. Obviously, I mean the the one thing that we're not doing is the, the signing table, which by the way is to me the most important part of of a, of a book event because you just get that one minute with with each person to say hello, to reconnect with people that you've seen previous years. Uh, so that's the that's the one thing that we're not doing, but um, uh, we're trying to you know make it as safe as possible for everyone who's in the audience. Um, for me to try to get through this uh, long trip without without contracting the virus, and I just it's been wonderful to be back out again. The only yeah. problem is that you're not with me. You were supposed to be with me, um, but you were doing something last night. I think I saw you on television last night. Were you on TV last night? A little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Just, just, a, just a little a bit. A tiny bit? Okay. Just a little bit. Um, so let's talk about Portrait of an Unknown Woman. And I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about the book, but no spoilers. Um, 
the book um, is a book that I've been dying to write for a very long time. Um, it, it, in, uh, in the beginning of the book, we see Gabriel transition as, as hinted um, in the last book and, and the, book, the, the prior book. Um, he retires from the office at the beginning of this novel and settles quietly with, with Chiara and the children in Venice to resume his career as an art restorer. Um, and interestingly enough, he'll be working for his wife, uh, which is something that I happen to know a little, little something about. Um, his wife, Chiara, is now the director of, the, or excuse me, the, uh, the general manager of the, the, the Champolo Restoration Company in Venice, the most prominent restoration firm in Venice. Gabriel is the director of the paintings department, so he, he reports to, uh, to his wife. Um, and it, as often is the case, um, he gets pulled away from what he's, what he's supposed to be doing. Um, it, uh, in this case, um, his old friend Julian Isherwood stumbles into Venice with yet another problem. And Gabriel soon finds himself on the hunt for probably the greatest art forger who ever lived. And the, the wrinkle in the story, the twist, is that in order to find the greatest art forger who ever lived, Gabriel Milan must become the greatest art forger who ever lived. It is a fast-paced, entertaining, um, lighter, um, at times hilarious journey through the dirty side of, of the art world. And it, uh, I, I like to think of it sort of as a, a cross between the Thomas Crown Affair and the television show Billions. <laughs> Um, and it, it, it deals with a question that a lot of people in the art world don't really like to talk about. And that is exactly how many of those beautiful paintings that you see in auction houses and, and art galleries and on the walls of museums, how many of those are actually fakes and frauds and completely misattributed? And how many are? Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you asked that question. Um, the, the short answer is, I don't know, and I don't think anyone truly knows. Um, but in doing my research, I stumbled across some, some interesting numbers. Um, a few years ago, a, a well-known Swiss authenticator caused a firestorm in the art world when he said that 50% of the paintings circulating through the commercial art market were fakes. 50, per, five, zero. One for one, half of the work circulating through the commercial art world are fakes, or they have been, um, I would say, deliberately, fraudulently misattributed. Um, and it, everyone was up in arms. Um, interestingly enough, it's the exact number that the late Thomas Hovey, who was the legendary director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, in New York, it's an exact number that he always stood by. That it's one for one for every real genuine painting out there. There is a fake, a fraud, something that has been deliberately misattributed by, by an art dealer or fraudulently um, restored by someone. Um, a dear friend of mine is, is working in this issue. He was a, a, um, a notable museum director, um, directed several museums. <clears throat> and he's working now on a uh, um, on a project to use AI, artificial intelligence, to help identify and attribute paintings. Is, is this he, Max? Is this Max? I'm not going to say who this is. Okay. I'm not going to say who this is. Um, um, and this person told me, um, in his estimation, in his expert opinion, that it's somewhere in the upper teens to 25%. That's where he thinks it is in that band right there. It's an extraordinary uh, number. I mean, think if, if the jewelry market, for example, you know, if, if, if one fourth or, uh, you know, 25% of all jewelry was fake gold and fake diamonds, it's, but sold is the real thing. Um, and so there, there's a problem out there. Um, and, then, and this book explores that issue and how that comes to be. I mean, um, look, there are some very, very fine. Um, art dealers in this business, people who just you know, revere art and, and would never willingly do anything wrong. But there are a lot of dirty art, art dealers out there who, sell, who, who willingly sell forgeries. We had a case in Florida. Um, we're coming tonight from, from Books and Books um, in, in, in Palm Beach. 
Worth Avenue, the glitzy avenue in, in, in Palm Beach, a, a big high profile gallery. He was selling fake paintings at huge, huge markups, allegedly, I should say. I mean, he has been arrested. Um, he wasn't going to any special, taking any special steps. He was buying copies online and just selling them to his unsuspecting clients. So he paid four or $500 for a painting online and, and tell his clients that it's a real Basquiat or a real uh, Rothko or something and, and get 10 or 12 million for it. So one of the things, somehow I know something about your research during, <laughs> during the years. I have a little, uh, but one of the things that surprised me was you talked about that museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, you talk about Hobing, he actually did an exhibit there where he laid out all of the, you know, fakes, frauds, uh, misattributions. Yeah, I think the, 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 um, the National Gallery in, in, um, in London did a similar exhibit. We're just um, open kimono, as we say. And we, and, you know- I don't these, think we're allowed to say that anymore. We're not? I don't was, think so. Was that a microaggression? I think it was. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, but it, but, it, but we, um, uh, they laid it out and said, this is where we've been fooled. And they had a, they had a multi-room exhibit of all the of, 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 of forgeries, um, paintings that, that, that they, including a Botticelli that they thought they had purchased a Botticelli. They did not purchase a Botticelli. It was much later um, pastiche you know, by a follower of, of Botticelli. Um, in the 1970s, the Met, um, as we would say, downgraded more than 300 paintings in its European paintings collection. That was something, I'm gonna get the number wrong, but it's about 15% of its entire holdings of European paintings. They took it all down, took them and, and um, said that they were misattributed. What, would, would you talk for a minute about what misattributed sure. means? Um, because there's a something and then there's a school of something and then there's in the something of something. So, to, to so in, in old master paintings, of course, uh, we have um, um, levels of attribution, I'll call it. The, the, the clearest attribution would be um, by a painter, okay, by Titian. Um, if the auction house or the dealer, or the seller is not quite quite sure, he would say attributed to Titian. Um, of course, all old master painters of, of any note had large workshop operations. These were commercial enterprises, home decor, church decor, and they had apprentices and, and, and journeymen. And so you have um, an attribution workshop of Titian. Then you broaden out to painting painters who were in his orbit, um, but, in, but, in, but lived in his time. Circle of Titian. Then we get someone who's, uh, who is uh, 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 imitating him later, okay? A later imitator. Paints exactly like Titian, or he tries to. He would be painting, the attribution would be manner of Titian. And then you get even after that, a few years later, um, maybe even a century after him, you get after Titian. These are artists who are just producing copies. And what happened was, um, before we got sophisticated in how to determine what is what, a lot of this stuff got all mixed up. Um, and so, you know, in, in, when, when people started acquiring art in the 19th century, when, when British um, aristocrats would make, they, they would make the grand tour to Italy, okay? They would go and they'd bring home a bunch of art. Um, they were getting stuff that was completely, in many cases, completely misattributed. They were also getting just fakes copies that, that you know, Italian dealers were foisting on them. Um, same thing happened when, when wealthy Americans um, went, you know, started collecting. They were getting things that were completely, completely misattributed and, and just junk that these guys were selling to them. Um, so it's got, it got all mixed up over the years. And then those, those wealthy Americans would, of course, donate their paintings to museums. Um, and so you get something in a Midwestern museum, for example, that says, you know, whatever, Holy Family, Madonna and Child, Titian. Well, it's not a Titian. It's not a Titian. It, uh, I, I'm speaking 
um, for, as, as an example of so how, how something might go wrong. Um, and, and so it, it, it's taken a long time to just sort of demote and downgrade and really figure out um, what is actually what. So and then sometimes, but sometimes something will get downgraded and then another a scholar will come back and say, wait, not so fast. That's actually is a Titian. That is a Botticelli. We were wrong to downgrade it. So there's a, there's a wonderful expression or a, a quote that I, I came across that the attributions of paintings should be written in pencil because they change. Huh. And, and they change because of, 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 of who's examining them with, with what technical tools and what they, what they can bring to it. Um, so paintings sort of come in and out and obviously if you're the owner of a painting like that, your, the value of your painting can go up wildly or it can be worth nothing. I mean, ne next to nothing with a change of attribution. So, so let's get back to, to Gabriel Alon's <clears throat> role in all of this. Um, Gabriel Alon is pretty darn good at spotting fakes. Well, we, have, we have seen Gabriel um, um, <clears throat> be used as an uh, authenticator before. Julian used, uses Gabriel frequently um, because he's, he, as he likes to say, he's been around paintings for a hundred years. Um, art restorers, because they are really in a painting. I mean, they are right there nose to nose with it. They know these paintings a lot better than, than many art historians and connoisseurs. Um, and then many, um, experts like Gabriel have, do have a sixth sense. Of, they're, they're, they're known as fake busters. Um, um, that, that, that when they see something that's wrong, they just know it instantly. Mm -hmm. they, um, they, they just know it instantly. Francis O'Connor, the late Francis O'Connor, um, the expert in Jackson Pollock. Um, obviously Pollock is someone who was has been forged a lot, um, probably being forged right now. Someone is, someone right now is out there forging a Pollock and getting ready to put it on the market. He can, he said that he could tell in one second whether it was whether it was real or not, and that there are people who just uh, possess that ability. And Gabriel is one of them. One of the other things about this book that I love was is not only that it's funny, but you bring back a lot of your older characters. It is a it is a grand ensemble. I mean, <laughs> Oliver Oliver Dimbleby is back. Don Orsati is back. We go back to Corsica. The goat is back, a fan favorite. The goat is, is back. Um, Gabriel seems to be in a new place in his life and his children are a little older, old enough so that they have some star turns. Yeah, I, um, you'll see in chapter two, there's a paragraph or two um, where I make the turn with Gabriel. Um, and he is, he's the same character, um, but he just, I just restored him a little bit. I retouched him a tiny, tiny bit. Um, in, in, in for this final lap of, of his, of his life, um, um, and the series. And, and, um, I, 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 love this version of Gabriel. This is where I always wanted the series to end up. Um, uh, you know, many, many of the books have had um, art components to them or have begun in the art world and then they branched off elsewhere. This one, this one um, begins in the art world and for the most part stays in the art world. Um, and one of the things that was, um, I, I didn't want to say struggled with, but when, when Gabriel was the director of the office and he's jetting around the world doing, you know, <clears throat> global operations, um, it was hard for me to bring this, the, slow the, the books down enough for him to get some meaningful time with his, his children. And I was able um, at the beginning of this novel to have a couple of really nice scenes with these amazing children of his. Um, and look, I, I love writing female characters. Um, um, you know, my the series is, is 
populated with really remarkable women. And Gabriel's daughter, Irene, is, is the newest addition to that. And she is a handful. Um, <laughs> she, is, uh, she, she looks exactly like Gabriel's mother and has uh, all of, all of uh, Kiara's mannerisms. So she's a, she's, when he looks at his daughter, he sees the two most important women in his life. And she is, she's just a special, special child and they have a great relationship. And there's some, she has a, she has a star turn in this book, yeah. Can you give us one example of Irene who, who appears to call out her father at anything <laughs> past her? An example of it, no spoilers, but she just does have a, um, um, she has a little bit of second sight to her. She's a little mm -hmm. bit of a magical character, always has been. Um, be, and it's because she looks so startlingly like he, every time he looks at this child, he sees his mother looking back at him. So she comes to the, uh, the table sort of imbued with, with some magic. Uh, and, and she does have a little touch of magic to her. 25 books. Yeah. Does it get easier with time or harder with time? Um, I would say harder in one respect in that, that um, um, you know, I took a vow that I was not going to die at the typewriter, as it were. Um, and I, while I plan to write for many more years, I, I do, there is a, a limit out there. So it's harder to, for me to, to settle on uh, a book. Um, and I want every, every sentence, every paragraph, every scene, I'm very picky about um, uh, because, it, you know, these are how, how my, my work is going to be measured. And so, it, it's, you, know, you know, some writers um, are, are guilty, I think, late in their career of, of, I don't want to say phoning it in, but they're not right necessarily writing their best. And I, I just don't ever want that to happen with me. I'm just going to give my, every ounce that I have into every, every book. Is it, is it fair to say, <clears throat> panic is the wrong word, but you, you hold yourself to a very high standard. You have an expression about whether a particular book is a worthy entry. Worthy, worthy addition to the series. I mean, look, Gabriel Alon series has some real high points to it. Uh, there's some, some books in the series um, whether it is the, the Confessor and the Death in Vienna and the Messenger, uh, uh, the English Girl and uh, the Black Widow. These are up there, I think, in, 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 in books that are, are, you know, will be remembered as some of the better books in, in, in the genre. Um, and I want each, every book to, to live up to that. Um, even, if it, even if it's a little bit of a, I don't want to say departure, but a little bit of different style. I mean, you know, this is, um, uh, slightly different in tone than, um, than, than previous books. Um, but I wanted there to be absolutely no um, uh, decrease in the perceived quality of it. Let's talk a little bit about process. Um, rumor has it that your wife built a very large, beautiful desk in your office. And you have a lovely computer. Where do you work? I, I work in longhand, in pencil, um, and I prefer to write on the floor. I prefer to write lying on my stomach on the floor. Um, odd, you say? Perhaps. Um, it, it, for, the, um, for those of you keeping score at home, <laughs> you can Google Muriel Spark, the author of uh, Miss Jean Brody. Um, you'll see it. The first photograph that'll come up, I think, is is this great photograph of young Muriel Spark lying on the floor with her notebooks. One of my favorite pictures of her, as, as um, one of my favorite writers. Um, I'm not alone in terms of there are some of us that still write in longhand. I know Nelson DeMille writes in longhand. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Ann Tyler habit of 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 she'll write her first draft at, in on computer. But she will, <clears throat> she'll do the revisions and the, and the edit, the second draft. She will write the book out in longhand. Mm -hmm. Why does she do that? Because it slows her down. 
and it forces her to write the sentences out. And it exposes where if they get a little discursive or almost a little something that doesn't quite um, uh, measure up or something that's a little um, a false note that, that writing in longhand exposes it, that, that it's just different than it is writing at the computer. I also get fiddle. I also get fiddle itis. I mean, what is fiddle like this? I just sit there at the computer and go click, click, click. It's very easy to make revisions. You know, go back and tick, 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 and and um, there's just something about slowing the pace down in longhand that I, I find that I can write um, better, more polished, complete um, copy. Uh, and it's amazing, but you know, when I, I finish, I'll get like you know, stack like this, and oh, I can really go back through it and find page after page after page of copy that just ends up in the book without a single revision to it. So you write a book a year, which means you really only have six months because you have to go through copy editing and publishing and touring. So it, it's, I, I know it starts around Labor Day and you hand in around April 1st. I hand in on April 1st. On April 1st. You don't outline. So will you describe what that six months, emotionally, what is that six months like and sort of how much time are you writing? How many days a week? Um, well, I work seven days a week, um, always. I write every day, always, um, uh, except when I'm out here, obviously. Um, I try to not overdo it early. Um, I, 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 if a, if, a, if a book is like this, you know, I have a, maybe about that much that I can see. Um, I, get to, I get to work as quickly as possible. I cannot bring it to life on notepads or, or you know, note cards. I can't outline it. Um, I, I, I get, sometimes I just really don't have a clear idea of where I'm going with the story. But I, as soon as I feel comfortable, I start writing and bring it to life. Um, I try not to overdo it in September and October. By November 1st, I'm starting to get a little jokey feel. A little, <laughs> uh, little, little, and then December 1st is when January 1st is utter deadline panic. Um, and so I will start working, you know, 10 hours a day sitting there, um, 12 hours a day, let, you know, in, in February. Um, I, I'm not a big sleeper. I've never been a big sleeper when I'm working on a book, you know three hours a night is, you know, maybe um, four hours on a good night. That's, that's what, what I sleep. Um, I get up, is, um, have a quick look at the papers, get dressed, get to work. Um, mornings are really, really, really important to me. Um, the computer that I write on is not attached to the internet. So no notifications are banging, mm -hmm. nothing. Um, I keep a separate computer for any internet searches. I do not check email. Um, I, I keep the phone set so that she's, Jamie is the only person that can call me. Uh, I don't take calls. I don't schedule calls. I don't do anything uh, until, until late in the afternoon. So we, we just have a couple more minutes before we're going to open it up to the people who have the really, really smart questions. So I'm going to do a little bit of a lightning round with you. I haven't done this. I'm not capable of lightning around. First of all, can you just show everyone, you usually are very formally dressed on book tour, but I got some texts about the event last night <laughs> and your footwear. Could I, could we all please see your footwear? Well, as, as, a, as an explanation for why I, I'm not wearing wool trousers and a formal woolen blazer. It's about 3000 degrees um, in the center of the country right now. I know that Book Passage is, is, is with us tonight. Um, boy, I wish we were in San Francisco, although it's warm there too. Um, so I did, um, I did, do I really, you really want to, you're going to make me- Show me this? the shoes and then we have, I have three final questions really quick. Let's see yeah, the shoes. Do this, but I, I- Oh my gosh, uh, what are those? They're Vans, uh, Vans old schools um, that I wore last night. Um, did you have cute little socks in there with them? I wear, I do have cute little socks on. Yeah, cotton, you know, no, no stretchy, you know, dress socks. It's just too hot. Um, 
look, the country's on, on fire. It was 104 degrees in London. Um, we went straight from, you know, predictions of a changing climate to a climate emergency. It happened in about three years that, that the climate has really changed uh, and not for the better. It's all so that you can wear van. <laughs> I, just, I just want to understand that climate. I'm going to be wearing Arab desert clothing soon uh, because it is really hot. It is really hot. Okay, really fast. All time favorite movie. Wow. All time favorite movie. Uh, Casablanca. Casablanca. All time favorite book, or if you have to pick three, you can pick three. I mean, um, come on, we're running 1984. Out of time. 1984. 1984. Uh, underrated as a thriller. And any, anyone who has read any of my books knows that I uh, adore Fitzgerald. And there are clear, clear, clear allusions to Fitzgerald in this book. Um, uh, and one of the interesting things about this novel is that a, a, a great deal of it takes place in New York. Gabriel makes two trips to, to New York, three trips to, to the tri-state area in the course of this novel and spends some time um, out on Long Island. Favorite artist. Gabriel is a restorer. Favorite artist. Oh, uh, gosh. Um, I mean, I, I could rattle off several old master artists. Um, I, I love, love, love uh, Impressionism. Um, and I'm crazy about American, uh, the, the ABEX movement. I, I love, I love Pollock and Rothko and Kunig and all those painters. Okay. I'm not gonna give you one artist. Last, last question from me. If you could have, this is sort of like desert island disc, but it's a dinner party. If you could have a dinner party and invite anyone you wanted to invite, who would you have at the dinner party? Oh boy. Well, I would I would love um, George Orwell to be there. Um, poor George. I really want to write a book so, or do a movie about about the writing of 1984. He's dying of tuberculosis. He's holed up in a cottage in Scotland. It'd just be a great story. Uh, so I'd like to have poor George or Eric Blair uh, there. Um, two writers that I just love and I love this, the legendary stories about them. I would love to have Gore Vidal and Norman Mailer at, at dinner. That would be great. Um, uh, the, the two of them had a, a great literary feud. Uh, it included one night at a New York co cocktail party. They got into an argument and, and Norman Mailer decked um, Gore Vidal and Gore Vidal's laying on the laying on the laying on the floor with his lip bleeding and, and said famously, once again, Mr. Mailer, words fail you. I'd, I'd, I'd love to, um, to have them at dinner. Um, I think it'd be great to have uh, Beethoven at dinner. He's, he's okay. deaf, so that would make it a little interesting. Um, Mozart would, would be a great dinner companion. He loved the nightlife. Um, so that, that, that'd be a good dinner table. And you, of course. Thank you. Um, with that, I think we should turn it over. I, Christina, can you come back and help us because I see that there are questions in the Q&A slot, but it's hard for me to read them. So you take it from here. Here I am. Thank you. Gore Vidal and Norman Mailer. I love that. <laughs> I love that. OK, so we have a lot of questions. OK, let's start with a question from Brett. What was the inspiration for the goat? The goat? Um, it's gonna be on my, my literary tombstone, that darn animal. Um, you know, it was just, it was just, he would just appeared in the, in the second book of the series. Uh, and you know, that every time Christopher had to get um, to his villa on Corsica, this darn goat uh, blocked his path. Um, and in my manuscript, I wrote this scene um, and look, I, I, I grew up in uh, half of my, my life in, in, uh, in Michigan and half in Central California. I have experience with farm animals, okay? Um, this goat is, is, I guess he probably came out of my, my, my childhood. Um, he, and I had this line in the manuscript, the goat detested the Englishman. 
I had to go through, I had to fight so long to keep that line in the book because the, co the copy editor said, a goat cannot detest him. You can't give him these qualities. I said, you're wrong. Um, so that's where he appeared. And then he, when, when I brought Christopher back into the series um, in, with a book called uh, The English Girl, uh, the goat was still there. Um, and so he would be at this point, I think the longest lived domestic goat in, in history. He's a great character, um, not because he himself is such a great character, but, but what it allows me to do um, uh, with the characters who confront this beast. Um, there is a scene in the epilogal section of the book, late in the book, uh, that is one of my, the favorite, my favorite things I've ever written. And the goat is the centerpiece for that. Thank you. From Carol, did you have the ending in mind when you started writing? This one, um, definitely, because this is, I guess this novel falls into the category of the sort of the caper heist story. And caper heist stories, of course, always have to have, to have a killer twist at the end. Um, without giving too much away, obviously the twist in this one involves the, the real identity of this forger who is, um, um, uh, putting these unbelievable, these, these masterpieces out on the marketplace. And so um, that the identity is held to the very last chapter of the novel, almost the darn last page. Um, so I knew how, how it was going to end. I wasn't quite sure how it was going to get there, um, but I did know how this one's going to end. Thank you. From Mickey, how did Daniel originally become interested in art restoring Israeli intelligence and all the wonderful worlds he places us in? Oh boy, that's a broad question. Um, I was a big reader as a child. Um, I, I just, um, you know, I, I, you probably don't remember The World at War, that television program on public television back in the 70s. I watched that program religiously on KQED in San Francisco and, and just really became interested in history in World War II um, and the Holocaust and the history of the Middle East and the and history of, of, of Israel. And Gabriel sort of stands at the crossroads of a lot of things that I'm interested in, including art. I'm just passionate about art. Um, uh, my mother took me to a Van Gogh exhibit um, when it came to the United States in the 70s and I went to the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco to see this and I just, I was hooked from the beginning. I'm crazy about art. Um, and so, you know, the restoration aspect to Gabriel's character, there was a little bit of um, serendipity. Um, you know, while I was creating the character, I just happened to have dinner with a dear friend of mine who is one of the world's finest art restorers. I mean, truly. Um, and I was like, well, hold on a minute. You know, wouldn't this be interesting if this was his, if Gabriel's cover job? Um, and I, I, um, um, pulled him aside at dinner and I said, you know, I have this crazy idea. I'd like to turn an Israeli assassin into an Italian art restorer. Can, can you help me do that? He said, absolutely. And so I um, spent the next few days in the, in the laboratory at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, studying restoration. I learned everything I could get about the craft of restoration. It seemed to me that there had, it had a, a great deal in common with the craft uh, of, of counterterrorism and assassination. I blended the two together um, and Gabriel Lawn was born. And, and, and look, re restoration, um, not only art restoration, but the concept of restoration is critical uh, to the series. I mean, uh, every, every, the plot of every book revolves around restoration in some way um, and not just art, um, restoration of uh, uh, writing historical wrongs fixing people, fixing situations. Gabriel's just one of those people. He can fix a painting. Um, he, can, he can make an old car run again. Uh, he's very special in that regard. Thank you. Um, from Barbara, do you think the Salvadore Mundi is an original Da Vinci or do you think it falls within that 50% rule that it could be a potential forgery? Were you at all inspired by the incredible story of provenance an ultimate sale of the Mundi for $580 million. Um, 
but I'm going to be careful about uh, how I, sp I speak about the painting. Um, um, so no, it's not a forgery. Um, I guess I put my feelings about about the painting in um, uh, the a book called The New Girl because it's actually in the book. And and so Gabriel said of the painting um, that it's possible that a very small portion of it was a Leonardo a long time ago. Um, so that, that's where I would guess I would come down on it. Um, I am troubled by the fact that, that on the panel itself, there's a huge, huge knot. Uh, it, it seems, um, I find it hard to believe that, that Leonardo would, would, would put it on a painting, a piece of wood that's so flawed. Um, if you were able to see what the picture really looks like, um, and, and a friend of mine was able to see it when it was taken down, okay, when all the, the varnish was taken off and all of the work that previous restorers had done over the centuries was taken down. If you could really see what it looks like, it's a, it's a wreck. Um, and so it was restored by the greatest restorer in the world. She is remarkable. Um, so much of what you see um, is her work. And so I guess I would categorize the painting um, not as dubiously restored or fraudulently restored, but as it's over restored. Um, it, it looks perfect. I actually had, had a chance to see it um, bef before Sotheby's got it and, and turned it into this global sensation. Uh, I can't say where I saw it, um, but I, I was face to face with it um, in a vault. Um, and, and when the light came on and it hit the painting, it is one of those arresting images. You just sort of go, whoa. Um, and it, it does look like Leonardo's work. Um, it's an odd painting, but still it, it grabs you. Um, but I, I, would, I would say of the painting that it's definitely um, over restored. Um, and perhaps it would have been nicer if, if she had maybe had a little bit of a lighter touch to it. Um, it, it might stay a Leonardo. Um, I don't think that, that um, MBS is ever going to let anyone lay their hands on it, study it further. Um, but I, I'm, a, I'm, a little, I'm a little dubious about the attribution. Thank you. Um, from Linda, I am amazed that your books anticipate future events like the oligarchs in the cellist. How does that happen? Um, you know, when you, when you write um, international thrillers involving um, world events, current events, the, the worst thing that you could happen to you um, is that your book feels dated, that events have passed you by. So, so whenever, before I start a book, I always try to imagine, um, you know, what is the world going to look like a year from now when this work is published. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm compelled to, um, you know, but I do approach my work a bit like a, an intelligence analyst. I mean, you know, an intelligence analyst doesn't want to tell his customer, his prime minister, his president, what's happening today. He needs to tell um, his customers what's going to happen, what he thinks is going to happen. And I think that I'm sort of under the, the same obligation. I just happen to have been, um, fortuitous and that I, I, was, I, was, I was pretty good at it. I did get overtaken by some events. I, I, in, in The Black Widow, for example, um, I, I just knew talking to people in the counterterrorism business that ISIS was gonna develop a, an international terrorist network, that Europe and France was gonna be hit by ISIS very, very hard. I just knew it was going to happen. I, I started writing the book um, and, and um, it, you know, that book really just predicted everything that happened, including, you know, I used Molenbeek in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Belgium as a setting. Um, the new girl sort of did get overtaken by events. And I did have to, after the take killing of, of, of Khashoggi, I had to throw out a, a large portion of, the, of that book and rewrite it and recraft it. Um, uh, uh, hastily. Um, and so it ended up being sort of a Romana clay about the Khashoggi affair. So sometimes I, sometimes I sort of 
um, predict too well what's going to be happening and I get caught as a result. We have a couple of people who would like to know if Michael Osborne mm. is ever returning in a novel. You know what? I, you know, that's one I, I feel really badly about. Um, I, 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 I really thought for a while that I was going to get two series going um, so that I would have the Gabriel series and the Michael series. And there obviously there was connected tissue between the two. Um, Adrian Carter of the CIA being the most obvious connective tissue. Um, and I thought that I would be nice to have those two series going. And Gabriel was just really working and I was enjoying writing him. And it, it, Michael just got a little too far removed and too many years went by. And, I, and I, I let it go. And I think it would be hard to bring him back. I mean, if I were to start another series or write some books that are um, that feature another character. I do think it would probably be Christopher Keller and, 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 and MI6 rather than going back to Michael. Thank you. Um, someone would like to know, since you know so much about art, were you ever a painter? Uh, I would not call myself a painter, uh, but I did uh, um, always take art classes in, in high school and even in college drawing and painting. Uh, I'm terrible. I'm terrible, like, I'm crazy about art. And then lots of people that would like to know, will there be a movie or a series from the books? And if so, I, I, I had a, play Gabriel. I thought I had the, the, the deal um, a couple of years ago with, with MGM television. Uh, a little scandal erupted in Hollywood not long after I signed the deal. This sort of threw the industry into turmoil. Um, we fell behind on our, our, our schedule. The rights reverted back to me. Um, uh, my uh, Hollywood agent, who is my wife, is actually talking to some people right now. I can't say who they are. I can say that one of them is my one of my favorite, favorite, favorite screenwriters. Um, and I am ever hopeful. Um, but look, the, this is sensitive material. It's controversial material. Gabriel's you know, very existence is controversial in some quarters. Um, and that, so, you know, I have to have some guarantees, some very specific guarantees in my contract. Um, and if, you know, if I can't get a deal that I'm absolutely comfortable that something good is going to be made, I am, I am absolutely um, uh, happy to leave him on the page and let him um, live in that universe alone. Thank you. We'll do two more. One from Doug. What element of your novels has surprised you the most in terms of popularity amongst your readers? The, the whole thing. I mean, look, Gabriel was never supposed to be a continuing character. He was supposed to appear in one book and one book only. I had to be convinced to write a second Gabriel long book. I was concerned that it would never work as a, as a mass market product, that, that an Israeli hero could never truly um, work globally um, for all the reasons I, I, I spoke about a, a moment ago. Um, and so I, I, I had an idea for this, uh, the second book it, uh, involved Nazi art looting during the Second World War and the conduct of, of the Swiss government and the Swiss banks. I plugged Gabriel into that setting, introduced a character named Anna Wolf, um, a Swiss violinist who, was, who makes an appearance in this novel. And my goodness, it sold more than the previous book. Um, it seems crazy to think now that Confessor is one of my um, most popular books. It's on a couple of lists of the greatest thrillers of all time. When I first drew up the notes for The Confessor, Gabriel was not in that book. My editor said he must be in that book. I put him in that book. Um, it's, and if that's the point where he be, became a, a series, um, the, the notion that I, I never dared to imagine that he might be a number one New York Times bestselling uh, character. Um, so that is the, really the biggest surprise. The, the entire thing is a surprise to me. Thank you. Uh, from Paula, Daniel, I love your books and did realize you knew, I didn't realize you knew so much about art forgeries. 
Do you also have an opinion on theft? I would love in my lifetime to see the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Do you think it will ever be found? You know, I, I hate to say this out loud, uh, but I'll go ahead and say it. Um, I, I am planning uh, to do um, a novel about that theft. Um, and I guess to answer the question truthfully, um, I don't think it's ever going to be found. I, and I think that, you know, the, um, there's, you know, there's a lot of BS about art theft, you know, that, that the people think that, that, you know, that collectors don't buy stolen art and there isn't a market for stolen art and that stolen art it gets, you know, circulated among criminals. I think that's nonsense. Uh, my character Maurice Durand is a is a, an art thief and art a broker for stolen art. He's a, obviously a, um, a little bit of a superheated character, but there there is a huge market for stolen art. Um, I don't know where those paintings are from the Gardner heist. Um, the, the fact that they've been gone for so long um, would would say to me that that um, someone's got them, someone's keeping them, um, or they might have been lost or destroyed in some way. Um, I am really interested in art theft. Um, art theft is going to uh, play a role in, in, in future books. Um, and I've been crazy about art forgery for a long time. And I think, I think people are gonna learn a lot about art forgery by reading this book. Um, and they're going to see Gabriel Alon uh, forge uh, some paintings. Um, I mean, a, a restore of his talent would be a, if he were to break bad, I mean, he would be lethal with a paintbrush in his hand. He, he could fool anybody. He, um, I'll, I'll give one little spoiler. He's just screwing around in his studio and he paints a perfect, he paints two perfect Modiglianis in a, in a matter of hours. And if he were to take those onto the market, he could make tens of millions of dollars doing it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So you're both amazing. We love your books so much. We love carrying them. We love selling them. We're so grateful for your time, for being with us tonight. Thank Can't you. thank you enough. Um, thank you to everyone watching, to our partner bookstores, and hopefully we will see you the next time in person. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Guys, everyone out there, thank you so much for, for for joining us this evening and again maybe you know next year in person we hope thank you both thank have you a both. great have a great evening everyone thank bye. you bye bye